Please open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 15. I'll meet you there in just a moment. Matthew chapter 15. We're glad to see all of you here tonight. And I hope that if you're visiting that you'll stay with us and have ice cream after the worship service tonight. We're very much looking forward to that. And uh, we're certainly glad that you are a part of our worship service this evening. There was a man who received a heart transplant and according to the story, the doctor only had the heart of a sheep. Well, at any rate, the man comes back after a six-month checkup and the doctor asks him. He said, sir, I've got to ask you, how are you doing? The man looked at the doctor and he said, not bad. <laughs> you know, every time I think of that story, there's so much truth out of that one little statement. Whatever is in here will come out through here. Jesus taught this in Matthew chapter 15, beginning in verse 18, when he said, those things which proceed out of the heart and out of the mouth, he said, uh, they come forth from the heart and they defile the man. For out of the heart proceeds evil thoughts, adulteries, murders, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. These are the things, he said, that defiles a man. But to eat with unwashing hands, that defiles not a man. It's interesting that the disciples in Jesus' day thought they were more holy because they washed their hands before they eat. <laughs> and they come to Jesus and they said, your disciples aren't washing their hands before they eat. So Jesus answers them. It really doesn't matter what goes in your mouth. What matters most is what comes out because it comes forth from the heart. We began a sermon series about different sins and each month, I told you we would notice two of these, but maybe last month I think we only noticed one. So I want to pick up in our series in Proverbs chapter 6. I invite your attention there tonight. We're talking about different sins. And you know, Christianity is a religion of the heart. Everything that we do, say, think, or feel somehow in Christianity goes back to the very root, which is what is in here. You know, I like what David wrote when he said, Examine me, O Lord, and prove me, and try my reins and my heart. You know, that's the goal for all of us here tonight. The reason why we're here is because, you know, we want God to literally mold and shape our hearts. You know, he also wrote, If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. So what we're talking about tonight is a very serious thing. This is a very up-close and personal thing type thing. And I hope that all of us certainly will walk away from here better people with better hearts and with a heart to serve God. There was a sign on the lawn of a drug rehabilitation program, uh, the building where they met. And this sign said uh, that was sitting there right in the yard, you could see it the first thing, it said, keep off the grass. <laughs> I thought that was pretty fitting for a drug rehab uh, facility. But you know, something I've learned about drug addiction and those who are addicted to drugs, you can send them to all the rehabs in the world. You can pay thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars for them to go to treatment. And if they don't want to stop, they're not going to stop. You know, a man has to really change his heart in order for, to start fixing things. And that's what we're going to talk about tonight. We're going to talk about how a person can change his heart. Let's, let's talk about some of these sins as well. Proverbs chapter 6 and verse 16, here's our lesson. Talking about sins of the heart, we're going to notice the next in the list. There's a list here. We've noticed some of these already. We talked about the sin of pride. We talked about sins of the tongue. We've talked about uh, the sin of shedding innocent blood. And then, of course, we move in tonight, a heart that devises wicked imaginations. Let's begin, if you're ready, Proverbs 6, beginning in verse 16. These six things doth the Lord hate, yea, seven are abomination unto him, a proud look, a lying tongue, uh, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that deviseth wicked imaginations, feet that be swift in running to mischief, a uh, false witness that speaketh lies, and he that soweth discord among brethren. So you have seven total there, and some of these we've already talked about 
But for th this one tonight, number one, there are three of these that we're going to talk about. The first is the sin of desire. You know, not all desire is wrong. In fact, there are healthy desires that are really, really good. In fact, we're studying in the book of Song of Solomon in Bible class. We're talking about some, some very healthy desires between husbands and wives. But it's interesting to me how society has sort of changed that to be an evil thing. I guess in the dark ages when husbands and wives slept in separate rooms, they said that the intimacy practiced between husband and wife was evil. It was only for procreation. And I wonder how long that has trickled down through the years to show that that is still evil. Friend, that is not an evil desire. What makes it evil is when it is practiced outside of the bonds of marriage. Let's talk about the seriousness of this. If you will, I invite your attention to Matthew chapter 5 tonight. Matthew chapter 5. There was a woman who was going to buy a dress and her husband was always irritated with the things that she would buy because she was always buying things. So she comes home with this dress and the dress was about $160. He said, what are you doing? You're buying everything. Why are you buying all these things? He said, look, the dress looks great. But you should have told the devil to get behind you because she said the devil made her do it. He said, you should have told the devil to get behind you. She said, I told him, but he said the dress looks good from back here too. <laughs> you know, desires can, can get out of control. So when we talk about this desire tonight, we've got to practice it in the bonds between husband and wife. Look here in Matthew chapter 5. The Bible says, You have heard that it was said by them of old time that you shall not commit adultery. Now, everybody knows that, right? <laughs> but Jesus took it a step further. And he said, I say unto you, that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her in his heart. The seriousness of this is shown in the next few verses because if he said, if your eye causes you to sin, King James uses fin, cut it out and cast it far from you. For it is better that one of your members should perish and not that your whole body should be cast into hell. If your right hand offends you, he said, cut it off and cast it from you for it's better that one of your members should perish and that not that your whole body should be cast into hell. I see the seriousness of this, friend. Lust can cause us to be lost. So it's a serious thing. All the sins of the heart are very serious. This one definitely is serious because it is a matter of difference between heaven and, heaven and hell. And certainly uh, tonight we're seeing that. I want to share some t statistics with you that I found on webroot.com. Now I understand there are young ears in the audience tonight, so I'm not going to uh, go into great details and hopefully don't generate too many questions. But here's what it says on webroot.com. Every second that goes by, 28,258 users are watching pornography on the internet. $3,075.64 is being spent every second on pornography on the internet. Every day there are 37 videos created in this fashion in the United States. 2.5 billion emails receiving and sending out are going out and being received uh, every day. 68 million search queries related to these things, which makes a total of 25%. I was sort of shocked by that. 116,000 queries uh, are related to these types of things as well. There are 200,000 Americans who are classified as addicts. 40 million American people regularly visit these sites. 35% of all internet downloads are related to this. 64% of ages 13 to 24 actively seek this out every week. I was shocked by that as well. The primary consumer are boys from 12 to 17 years old. 
Friend, my heart goes out to the kids. It makes me terrified for my own, to be honest with you. It's so easily accessible today, even the beer commercials or whatever comes on TV, I won't even let my children sit in front of the TV anymore. Not without someone in the room or unless I know they're watching kids' tunes or whatever else. Friend, our society has turned what God says is so beautiful into something that is so terrible. Evil desires can cause people to be lost. So here, here's the good news. How do we fix this? What is it that will change the hearts of people today if this is a sin in their hearts? I want to give you several verses, uh, and I'll tell you what. Let's go to Proverbs chapter 4, and verse 23. Uh, there was a man, he said, An apple a day keeps the doctor away if you aim it at his head. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> you know, it's interesting to me that the devil is really afraid of you at times. Did you know that? It's funny how Peter described the devil as a roaring lion walking about seeking whom he may devour. But it's interesting that James described the devil and he said, submit yourselves to God, resist the devil, and he will do what? He will flee from you. Draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. Friend, the devil's not big and bad as he thinks he is. How do we defeat the devil. I love this passage and if you're there in Proverbs, just stay there just for a minute. I'm going to give you two that you could write in your margin if you would like. But notice this about the heart. The Bible says the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. It pierces even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and notice is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. If people will only put the word of God in their lives and in their hearts, it would change the things that they desire. It would change the way they think about the things that they desire. Well, I hope today that if you struggle, I don't know who you are. It, it could be anyone in an audience this size. There's no telling what goes through people's minds and people's lives. But I want you to know you can change. I had two men in the past come to me when I was in Meridian. And they told me, they said, I have a problem with looking at things online that I should not look at. Two things I noticed about these two individuals. They were not getting what they were supposed to be getting from their wives at home. I think if couples would spend more time with each other, focusing on each other, this might fix some of the problems that we have in the brotherhood. Well, I hope today uh, that you and I can strengthen our hearts to avoid sins like this. Uh, notice this then, Psalm 119 and verse 11, he said, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. And if you're there in Proverbs chapter 4, I want to give you one word before I go on. He said, Keep thy heart. Uh, the interesting nature of this word keep is it literally means a guard post. Uh, the idea when a, Hebrew, when a Hebrew man is reading that word keep, that's what he's picturing in his mind. He, he's picturing a security guard post. So that's what he's saying. Guard your heart like a guard post. And when you do it, he says, uh, you will take care of the issues of life. So number one, sins of the heart is desire. We'll move on. Number two is also a heart of disobedience. So what I've done here in the sins of the heart is just go from, through the Bible and discuss what the Bible says comes out of the heart. Okay? Let's go to Hebrews chapter 6. I want to give you the second one. Hebrews chapter 6. There is a woman who at the airport, she, she gets her a snack, a little Kit Kat bar and something to drink. And she uh, sits down at her table but at any rate, she forgot a magazine, so she thought, all right, I'll get up and get me a magazine. And when she came back, there was a guy sitting at her table, and guess what he was eating? He was eating a Kit Kat bar. And she walked over there, she threw her magazine down, and she said, you low-life scum. I cannot believe you just took my Kit Kat bar. And she yanked up her drink, she got her magazine, she went and boarded the plane. That guy was shocked. <laughs> he 
He was like, woof, man, I don't know what was wrong with that lady. So anyway, she's huffing and puffing. She gets on the airplane. She sits down. She's still, she's thinking, I can't believe that. She bends down to get something out of her purse, and guess what she sees in there? <laughs> A Kit Kat bar. <laughs> he was eating his own Kit Kat bar. She thought it was hers. You know, it's, it's interesting to me. Sometimes uh, people, as humans, we focus on ourselves, don't we? Or we don't focus enough on ourselves. We focus on what's going on in other people's lives. You know, I'm surprised by preachers and brethren sometimes when they feel like they need to be the brotherhood police. And I think to myself, do you not have enough sins of your own <laughs> to be worried about everybody else's. Now, I know that sometimes elders, they have to step in, take care of issues in the church. And I understand sometimes preachers may have to preach lessons on certain things. Okay, I get it. But we as Christians should be the most understanding people in this world when it comes to sin because we're the ones who've been called out of it. The truth is, we used to live the same life they lived. <laughs> We used to be just as disobedient to God as they were. So I hope today that we begin to focus and see, see them how Jesus sees them. Will they be punished if they don't repent? Yes, they will be punished if they don't repent. But we would too. So we talk about the disobedient. Let's, let's not look down our noses at people. You know, let's think about how we can, can help in any way that we can. But look here in Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 13. He said, exhort one another daily. That's exactly what we've just been talking about. All of us here need exhorting daily. And friend, I'll tell you, preachers need it too. Uh, I'm not going to get to heaven by myself. I'll tell you that right now. Exhort one another daily while it is called today. Now notice, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. And he continues, For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold fast the beginning of our confidence, steadfast unto the end. Now notice this part. Today, if you will hear his voice, don't do what? Don't harden your heart. This is a heart of not desire, but a heart that literally says, I'm not going to do what anybody tells me to do. I'm especially not going to do what some God I can't even see tells me to do. He says, don't harden your heart. I see a heart of desire in the Bible. I see a heart of disobedience in the Bible. It's interesting as you keep reading in this text what he calls disobedience. Did you know that he calls it unbelief? I mean, let's keep reading here. Look, he said, For some, when they had heard, they did provoke, how not at all that came out of Egypt by Moses, not everybody was disobedient, he said, but with whom he was grieved forty years. Was it not them that had sinned and those carcasses that fell in the wilderness? And to whom swear he by they that should not enter into his rest, but unto them that believed not? So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. You know, today in the religious world, when people say that somebody did not believe, they say, well, they did not say, I believe and know who Jesus is. But friend, the biblical term of be belief and unbelief goes deeper than skin deep. It says they did not do what God said to go into the promised land. And it's interesting, he called that unbelief. They had hard hearts. There's an artist who drew a picture of a man. And this man was a street man. He lived on the street. He was very poor. He was homeless. And the artist said, I want to draw a picture of you. He drew a picture of him. When he got done, I mean, he looked dressed to the T. He had a top hat on, a suit, bow tie. I'm talking about a tuxedo, not just the regular. I'm talking about a real tuxedo with the tails and all. A cane. That homeless man looked at that painting of him. He said, wow, that's me. But he, he frowned. He said, that's, that's not really what I look like. The artist said to him, that is the way God looks at you. 
That left an impression on him. He never forgot that. You know, he thought about God from that point on. He's like, really? God sees me like that? Doesn't matter where you're from or what's going on in your life. If you're away from God, I want you to know tonight, He still loves you. But you've got to make the choice. Are you going to quit being homeless? Are you going to keep living on the streets with the devil? You've got to choose, you know? Am I going to keep hardening my heart or am I going to do what God says? Now let's go to Hebrews 10. How do we cure this? We, we gave the cure for the desire. Now, how do we cure the disobedience? Interestingly enough, it's found in the same book, the book of Hebrews chapter 10. Look at verse 22. He said, let us draw near with a true heart. How do you have a true heart tonight? If you were to describe a man who has a true heart, he's really, really faithful to God, what would you say he does? Well, he tells us right here, he has his heart sprinkled from an evil conscience. He has his body washed with pure water. That means he's been baptized into Christ. He continues. He says, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. This man is not unstable spiritually. He is going forward. If he falls down, he gets right back up again. He keeps on going. He continues. He said, he considers one another to provoke into love and good works. That's what this true heart man does. He, he provokes other people to do it too. He said he doesn't forsake the assembly of ourselves together as a manner of some is. But exhorting one another even so much the more as you see the day approaching. Now notice this. If you sin willfully, uh, some of your translations, if you go on sinning willfully, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. You know, I hear in the religious world, these people talk about once saved, always saved, and how a man cannot fall away from God. Well, friend, the whole book of Hebrews was written because people were falling away. <laughs> and he urged them, don't harden your heart. Don't be like those people in the wilderness that didn't go in because of unbelief. And he says, if you want to fix it, start applying these things. The heart of desire, the heart of disobedience. And then I want to call this one Third and finally, the heart of doubt. You know, it's closely kin to disobedience, but it's not the same. You know, this is more of the idea of being unprepared. One guy, he said, if ignorance is bliss, I consider myself to be pretty happy. <laughs> well, you can't get to the pearly gates of judgment and say, well, I just didn't know. The Bible says that God will take vengeance on them who know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 through 9. It's interesting, though, that Jesus taught about these people and he said, He who knew his master's will and did it not shall be beaten with many stripes, but he who did not know his master's will and did it not shall be beaten with few stripes. You know, sometimes we say about an individual who does something really, really horrible, we say, that fella is going to burn hot. It's actually a biblical principle. Jesus says there will be a greater punishment for those who knew the Master's will and they did not do it. The danger for us here tonight is you've been taught the truth. Particularly in regards to salvation, we're going to notice what God expects for you to do in order to be saved. And you know, you can either accept it or reject it. But here's the dangerous part. If I walk out of here tonight and I don't obey it, I know my master's will. And I'll be beaten with more stripes than if I didn't know it. I beg and plead with you tonight to think about it you have any doubt in your mind that you lay your head down tonight and you think, I just need to obey the gospel, friend, you call me. It don't matter if it's two o'clock in the morning. I'm fine with that. You, you come and obey the gospel. You're not going to hurt my feelings for waking me up for something like that. I promise you that. Let's talk about this doubt for a minute. I'm going to give you two passages and then I'm going to close. Let's go to 2 Chronicles chapter 12. I want to share with you this poem while you're turning there. 2 Chronicles chapter 12. Lord, I'm here and help me to see 
that I owe you my life, which is my responsibility. The best thing in life is no thing at all, but to love you for rescuing me from the fall. Love is an action, not just a feeling. And without faithfulness, my prayers will not even go past the ceiling. So all the sins, which could be the worst, would it not be failing to put you first? You know, Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God. That means we've got to start preparing. And that's what I call this sin of doubt. This is a man who's really not concerned too much about spiritual things. He's not really interested in preparing. Friend, that's a dangerous place to be. I was there at one time myself. In fact, I stayed there for quite a while. And I would urge you not to do the same that I did. You will regret a lot of things if you do that. The Bible says in 2 Chronicles 12 and verse 13, So King Rehoboam, he strengthened himself in Jerusalem. He reigned, for Rehoboam was one and forty years old when he began to reign. But notice what he did in the last part. He did evil because he prepared not his heart to seek the Lord. In Psalm 78, in verse 7 and 8, you'll notice the last part. He said, there was a generation that set not their heart aright, and their spirit was not steadfast with God. I hope you and I both will be mindful of where our hearts are every day. Whatever it may be, Christianity is a religion of the heart. There was a painting, and I wish I could have found it. I, I couldn't find it, but there's a painting by a, name, a man named Paul Morphy. He painted this painting of a young boy playing chess with the devil. And it's interesting because the devil has that boy in check. And there's one move that he can make in this painting. There's one move that he can make to change the whole game. And the point of the picture is for you to look at that picture and find out which move it is. And people look at this painting and they're looking and they, they find out, you know, the ones who really know how to play chess, they're looking at it and they find out exactly what that move is and you can just feel it in their minds. They're saying, just make that move. You know, God is really saying the same thing because no matter how hard he wants to force you to do it he won't he will not force you to obey his will because he wants you to do it out of love friend tonight I hope and pray that we'll be mindful of other people as well and help them Maybe not so much as their sins, and maybe we can help them, but it's not our job to be the police. Let's help them out of sin like someone helped us. You know, the psalmist said, I delight to do thy will, O my God, for thy law is where? It's in my heart. Do you put a Bible on your table at home? You have one on the shelf? Maybe in the living room, you can think right now in your mind, you know exactly where to go to find a Bible in your house. You could probably find five or ten of them. But I've got to ask you tonight, how many of you take that Bible off that shelf and put that Bible right in here? You see that we can avoid a lot of problems in life in that way. In Proverbs chapter 19 and verse 21, he said, There are many devices in a man's heart. Nevertheless, the counsel of the Lord shall stand. That's what makes a difference. Friend, if you've never obeyed the gospel tonight, I pray that you will heal your heart of any disease of sin that you've ever faced. You know as well as I do that not a one person in this room wants to stand guilty on the day of judgment. Will you come tonight? Give your heart to the service of God. God is calling you home right now. He doesn't want you to be that homeless man anymore. Here's what Jesus said. Go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. Mark 16, 15 and 16. But believing and being baptized are mentioned in those passages. But friend, I want to tell you, there's more to the plan than that. 
Jesus said in Luke 13, 3, unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. In fact, in Acts chapter 17, verse 30 and 31, it says, He commanded all men everywhere to repent. You've got to make some changes. You will never be good enough and you will never be perfect. So don't say to yourself right now, I just can't be a Christian because I'm not good enough to be a Christian. There's not a person in this world that's good enough to be a Christian. That's why God is reaching his hand out to you today. If only you'll take it. Jesus said, unless you confess me before men, I will not confess you before my Father who's in heaven. Matthew 10, 33. Once you make those steps, you are ready to, to obey the gospel the way that God has said for you to do it. It's interesting in Acts chapter 2 when the church began, they said, men and brethren, what shall we do? And he did not tell them, all you have to do is believe and ask Jesus to come into your heart. No, they already believed. That's why they said, what do we need to do? He told them in verse 38 of Acts 2, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. I wonder how relieved they were on that day. 3,000 souls were added to the Lord, according to verse 41 of that same chapter. 3,000 people obeyed the gospel when he told them what to do. I wonder if one will come tonight or this week. Just one. Today, friend, I want to urge you to do that. But if you've been baptized and you've fallen away, whether it's sins of the heart, whether it's sins of the tongue, whether it's sins of I don't know what, it could be anything, have you let them come into your life, keep you away from the Lord? Friend, the devil knows how to do his work. And I hope that you and I will fix that tonight. If you're here, please come. Be faithful to God, even now, as we stand, as we sing.